Russian Horror, The Stories of Fyodor Sologub. The White Dog by Fyodor Sologub. Everything grew irksome for Alexandra Ivanovna in the workshop of this out-of-the-way town. The patterns, the clatter of machines, the complaints of the customers. It was the shop in which she had served as apprentice, and now for several years, as cutter. Everything irritated Alexandra Ivanovna. She quarrelled with everyone, and abused the innocent apprentice. Among others, to suffer from her outbursts of temper— was Tanechka, the youngest of the seamstresses, who only lately had been an apprentice. In the beginning, Tanechka submitted to her abuse in silence. In the end she revolted, and, addressing herself to her assailant, said, quite calmly and affably, so that everyone laughed, "'Alexandra Ivanovna, you're a downright dog!' Alexandra Ivanovna felt humiliated. "'You were a dog yourself!' she exclaimed. Tanechka sat there sewing. She paused now and then from her work, and said, in a calm, deliberate manner, "'You always whine. Certainly you're a dog. You have a dog's snout, and a dog's ears, and a wagging tail. The mistress will soon drive you out of doors, because you are the most detestable of dogs, a poodle.' Tanechka was a young, plump, rosy-cheeked girl, with an innocent, good-natured face, which revealed, however, a trace of cunning. She sat there so demure, barefooted, still dressed in her apprentice clothes. Her eyes were clear, and her brows were highly arched on her fine curved white forehead, framed by straight, dark chestnut hair, which in the distance looked black. Tanechka's voice was clear, even, sweet, insinuating and if one could have heard its sound only, and not given heed to the words, it would have given the impression that she was paying Alexander Ivanovna compliments. The other seamstresses laughed, the apprentices chuckled, they covered their faces with their black aprons, and cast side glances at Alexander Ivanovna. As for Alexander Ivanovna, she was livid with rage. Wretch! she exclaimed. I will pull your ears for you. I won't leave a hair on your head. Tanechka replied in a gentle voice. The paws are a trifle short. The poodle bites as well as barks. It may be necessary to buy a muzzle. Alexander Ivanovna made a movement toward Tanechka. But before Tanechka had time to lay aside her work and get up, the mistress of the establishment, a large, serious-looking woman, entered, rustling her dress. She said sternly, "'Alexander Ivanovna, what do you mean by making such a fuss?' Alexander Ivanovna, much agitated, replied, "'Irina Petrovna, I wish you would forbid her to call me a dog.' Tanechka, in her turn, complained, "'She is always snarling at something or other, always quibbling at the smallest trifles.' But the mistress looked at her sternly, and said, "'Tanechka, I can see through you. Are you sure you didn't begin? You needn't think that because you're a seamstress now, you're an important person, if it weren't for your mother's sake. Tanechka grew red, but preserved her innocent and affable manner. She addressed her mistress in a subdued voice, Forgive me, Irina Petrovna, I will not do it again, but it wasn't altogether my fault. Alexander Ivanovna returned home almost ill with rage. Tanechka had guessed her weakness. A dog. Well, then I'm a dog, thought Alexander Ivanovna. But it is none of her affair. If I look to see whether she is a serpent or a fox, it is easy to find one out, but why make a fuss about it? Is a dog worse than any other animal? The clear summer night languished and sighed. A soft breeze from the adjacent fields occasionally blew down the peaceful streets, the moon rose clear and full, that very same moon which rose long ago at another place, over the broad, desolate steppe, the home of the wild, of those who ran free, 
and wind in their ancient earthly travail, the very same as then and in that region. And now, as then, glowed eyes sick with longing, and her heart, still wild, not forgetting in town the great spaciousness of the steppe, felt oppressed. Her throat was troubled with a tormenting desire to howl like a wild thing. She was about to undress, but what was the use? She could not sleep anyway. She went into the passage. The warm planks of the floor bent and creaked under her, and small shavings and sand which covered them tickled her feet not unpleasantly. She went out on the doorstep. There sat the babushka Stepanida, a black figure in her black shawl, gaunt and shriveled. She sat with her head bent, and it seemed as though she were warming herself in the rays of the cold moon. Alexandra Ivanovna sat down beside her. She kept looking at the old woman sideways. The large curved nose of her companion seemed to her like the beak of an old bird. A crow? Alexandra Ivanovna asked herself. She smiled, forgetting for the moment her longing and her fears. Shrewd as the eyes of a dog, her own lighted up with the joy of her discovery. In the pale green light of the moon, the wrinkles of her faded face became altogether invisible, and she seemed once more young and merry and light-hearted, just as she was ten years ago, when the moon had not yet called upon her to bark and bay of nights before the windows of the dark bathhouse. She moved closer to the old woman, and said affably, Babushka Stepanida, there is something I have been wanting to ask you. The old woman turned to her, her dark face furrowed with wrinkles, and asked in a sharp, oldish voice that sounded like a call, Well, my dear, go ahead and ask. Alexandra Ivanovna gave a repressed laugh. Her thin shoulders suddenly trembled from a chill that ran down her spine. She spoke very quietly. Babushka Stepanida, it seems to me, tell me, is it true? I don't know exactly how to put it, but you, Babushka, please don't take offence. It is not from malice that I— Go on, my dear, never fear. Say it, said the old woman. She looked at Alexander Ivanovna with glowing, penetrating eyes. It seems to me, Babushka, please now don't take offence, as though you, Babushka, were a crow. The old woman turned away. She was silent and merely nodded her head. She had the appearance of one who had recalled something. Her head, with its sharply outlined nose, bowed and nodded, and at last it seemed to Alexandra Ivanovna that the old woman was dozing, dozing and mumbling something under her nose, nodding her head and mumbling some old forgotten words, old magic words. An intense quiet reigned out of doors. It was neither light nor dark, and everything seemed bewitched with the inarticulate mumbling of old forgotten words. Everything languished and seemed lost in apathy. Again a longing oppressed her heart, and it was neither a dream nor an illusion. A thousand perfumes, imperceptible by day, became subtly distinguishable, and they recalled something ancient and primitive, something forgotten in the long ages. In a barely audible voice the old woman mumbled, Yes, I am a crow, only I have no wings. But there are times when I caw, and I caw, and tell of woe, and I am given to forebodings, my dear. Each time I have one I simply must caw. People are not particularly anxious to hear me, and when I see a doomed person I have such a strong desire to caw. The old woman suddenly made a sweeping movement with her arms, and in a shrill voice cried out twice, Caw! Caw! Alexander Ivanovna shuddered, and asked, Babushka, at whom are you calling? The old woman answered, At you, my dear, at you. It had become too painful to sit with the old woman any longer. Alexander Ivanovna went to her own room. She sat down before the open window, and listened to two voices at the gate. 
It simply won't stop whining, said a low and harsh voice. And uncle, did you see? asked an agreeable young tenor. Alexander Ivanovna recognized in this last the voice of the curly-headed, somewhat red, freckled-faced lad who lived in the same court. A brief and depressing silence followed. Then she heard a hoarse and harsh voice say suddenly, Yes, I saw. It's very large and white, lies near the bathhouse, and bays at the moon. The voice gave her an image of the man, of his shovel-shaped beard, his low, furrowed forehead, his small, piggish eyes, and his spread-out fat legs. And why does it bay, uncle? asked the agreeable voice. And again the hoarse voice did not reply at once. Certainly to no good purpose, and where it came from is more than I can say. Do you think, uncle, it, it may be a werewolf? asked the agreeable voice. I should not advise you to investigate, replied the hoarse voice. She could not quite understand what these words implied, nor did she wish to think of them. She did not feel inclined to listen further. What was the sound and significance of human words to her? The moon looked straight into her face, and persistently called her and tormented her. Her heart was restless with a dark longing, and she could not sit still. Alexandra Ivanovna quickly undressed herself. Naked, all white, she silently stole through the passage. She then opened the outer door. There was no one on the step or outside, and ran quickly across the court and the vegetable garden, and reached the bathhouse. The sharp contact of her body with the cold air, and her feet with the cold ground, gave her pleasure. But soon her body was warm. She lay down in the grass, on her stomach. Then, raising herself on her elbows, she lifted her face toward the pale, brooding moon, and gave a long-drawn-out whine. "'Listen, uncle, it is whining,' said the curly-haired lad at the gate. The agreeable tenor voice trembled perceptibly. "'Whining again, the accursed one,' said the hoarse, harsh voice slowly. They rose from the bench. The gate-latch clicked. They went silently across the courtyard and the vegetable garden, the two of them. The older man— black-bearded and powerful, walked in front, a gun in his hand. The curly-headed lad followed tremblingly, and looked constantly behind. Near the bathhouse, in the grass, lay a huge white dog, whining piteously. Its head, black on the crown, was raised to the moon, which pursued its way in the cold sky. Its hind legs were strangely thrown backward, while the front ones, firm and straight, pressed hard against the ground. In the pale green and unreal light of the moon it seemed enormous. So huge a dog was surely never seen on earth. It was thick and fat. The black spot, which began at the head and stretched in uneven strands down the entire spine, seemed like a woman's loosened hair. No tail was visible. Presumably it was turned under. The fur on the body was so short that in the distance the dog seemed wholly naked, and its hide shone dimly in the moonlight, so that altogether it resembled the body of a nude woman who lay in the grass and bayed at the moon. The man with the black beard took aim. The curly-haired lad crossed himself and mumbled something. The discharge of a rifle sounded in the night air. The dog gave a groan, jumped up on its hind legs, became a naked woman, who, her body covered with blood, started to run, all the while groaning, weeping and raising cries of distress. The black-bearded one and the curly-haired one threw themselves in the grass, and began to moan in wild terror. Hide and Seek by Fyodor Sologub 1. Everything in Lelechka's nursery was bright, pretty, and cheerful. Lelechka's sweet voice charmed her mother. 
Lelechka was a delightful child. There was no other such child. There never had been, and there never would be. Lelechka's mother, Serafima Alexandrovna, was sure of that. Lelechka's eyes were dark and large. Her cheeks were rosy. Her lips were made for kisses and for laughter. But it was not these charms in Lelechka that gave her mother the keenest joy. Lelechka was her mother's only child. That was why every movement of Lelechka's bewitched her mother. It was great bliss to hold Lelechka on her knees and to fondle her, to feel the little girl in her arms, a thing as lively and as bright as a little bird. To tell the truth, Serafima Alexandrovna felt happy only in the nursery. She felt cold with her husband. Perhaps it was because he himself loved the cold. He loved to drink cold water and to breathe cold air. He was always fresh and cool, with a frigid smile, and wherever he passed, cold currents seemed to move in the air. The Nesletyevs, Sergei Modestovich, and Serafima Alexandrovna had married without love or calculation, because it was the accepted thing. He was a young man of thirty-five, she a young woman of twenty-five. Both were of the same circle and well brought up. He was expected to take a wife, and the time had come for her to take a husband. It even seemed to Serafima Alexandrovna that she was in love with her future husband, and this made her happy. He looked handsome and well-bred. His intelligent grey eyes always preserved a dignified expression and he fulfilled his obligations of a fiancé with irreproachable gentleness. The bride was also good-looking. She was a tall, dark-eyed, dark-haired girl, somewhat timid but very tactful. He was not after her dowry, though it pleased him to know that she had something. He had connections, and his wife came of good, influential people. This might, at the proper opportunity, prove useful. Always irreproachable and tactful, this Letyev got on in his position not so fast that any one should envy him, nor yet so slow that he should envy any one else. Everything came in the proper measure and at the proper time. After their marriage, there was nothing in the manner of Sergei Modestovich to suggest anything wrong to his wife. Later, however, when his wife was about to have a child, Sergei Modestovich established connections elsewhere of a light and temporary nature. Serafima Alexandrovna found this out, and, to her own astonishment, was not particularly hurt. She awaited her infant with a restless anticipation that swallowed every other feeling. The little girl was born. Serafima Alexandrovna gave herself up to her. At the beginning she used to tell her husband with rapture of all the joyous details of Lelechka's existence, but she soon found that he listened to her without the slightest interest and only from the habit of politeness. Serafima Alexandrovna drifted farther and farther away from him. She loved her little girl with the ungratified passion that other women, deceived in their husbands, show their chance young lovers. Mamachka, let's play Priatki, hide and seek, cried Lelechka, pronouncing the R like the L, so that the word sounded Priatki. This charming inability to speak always made Serafima Alexandrovna smile with tender rapture. Lelechka then ran away, stamping with her plump little legs over the carpets, and hid herself behind the curtains near her bed. Tew, tew, Mamachka, she cried out in her sweet, laughing voice as she looked out with a single roguish eye. Where is my baby girl? the mother asked, as she looked for Lelechka, and made believe that she did not see her and Lelechka poured out her rippling laughter in her hiding-place. Then she came out a little farther, and her mother, as though she had only just caught sight of her, seized her by her little shoulders, and exclaimed joyously, "'Here she is, my Lelechka!' Lelechka laughed long and merrily, her head close to her mother's knees, and all of her cuddled up between her mother's white hands. Her mother's eyes glowed with passionate emotion. Now, Mamachka, you hide, said Lelechka, as she ceased laughing. Her mother went to hide. Lelechka turned away, as though not to see, but watched her Mamachka stealthily all the time. Mama hid behind the cupboard, and exclaimed, Tew, tew, baby girl! Lelechka ran round the room and looked into all the corners, 
making believe, as her mother had done before, that she was seeking, though she really knew all the time where her mamachka was standing. "'Where's my mamachka? asked Lelechka. "'She's not here, and she's not here,' she kept on repeating, as she ran from corner to corner. Her mother stood with suppressed breathing, her head pressed against the wall, her hair somewhat disarranged, a smile of absolute bliss played on her red lips. The nurse, Fiducia, a good-natured and fine-looking, if somewhat stupid woman, smiled as she looked at her mistress with her characteristic expression, which seemed to say that it was not for her to object to gentlewoman's caprices. She thought to herself, the mother is like a little child herself. Look how excited she is! Lelechka was getting nearer her mother's corner. Her mother was growing more absorbed every moment by her interest in the game. Her heart beat with short quick strokes, and she pressed even closer to the wall, disarranging her hair still more. Lelechka suddenly glanced toward her mother's corner, and screamed with joy. "'I found you!' she cried out loudly and joyously, mispronouncing her words in a way that again made her mother happy. She pulled her mother by her hands to the middle of the room. They were merry and they laughed, and Lelechka again hid her head against her mother's knees, and went on lisping and lisping without end her sweet little words, so fascinating, yet so awkward. Sergei Modestovich was coming at this moment toward the nursery. Through the half-closed doors he heard the laughter, the joyous outcries, the sound of romping. He entered the nursery, smiling his genial cold smile. He was irreproachably dressed, and he looked fresh and erect, and he spread round him an atmosphere of cleanliness, freshness, and coldness. He entered in the midst of the lively game, and he confused them all by his radiant coldness. Even Fiducia felt abashed, now for her mistress, now for herself. Seraphima Alexandrovna at once became calm, and apparently cold, and this mood communicated itself to the little girl, who ceased to laugh, but looked instead, silently and intently, at her father. Sergei Modestovich gave a swift glance round the room. He liked coming here, where everything was beautifully arranged. This was done by Serafima Alexandrovna, who wished to surround her little girl, from her very infancy, only with the loveliest things. Serafima Alexandrovna dressed herself tastefully. This, too, she did for Lelechka, with the same end in view. One thing Sergei Modestovich had not become reconciled to, and this was his wife's almost continuous presence in the nursery. "'It's just as I thought. I knew that I'd find you here,' he said, with a derisive and condescending smile. They left the nursery together. As he followed his wife through the door, Sergei Modestovich said rather indifferently, in an incidental way, laying no stress on his words, "'Don't you think that it would be well for the little girl if she were sometimes without your company? Merely, you see, that the child should feel its own individuality,' he explained in answer to Serafima Alexandrovna's puzzled glance. "'She's still so little,' said Serafima Alexandrovna. "'In any case, this is but my humble opinion.' I don't insist. It's your kingdom there. I'll think it over, his wife answered, smiling, as he did, coldly, but genially. Then they began to talk of something else. 2. Nurse Fiducia, sitting in the kitchen that evening, was telling the silent housemaid Daria and the talkative old cook Agathia about the young lady of the house and how the child loved to play Priatki with her mother. She hides her little face, and cries, Tew, tew! And the Berinia herself is like a little one, added Fiducia, smiling. Agathia listened and shook her head ominously, while her face became grave and reproachful. That the Berinia does it, well, that's one thing. But that the young lady does it, and that's bad. Why? asked Fiducia with curiosity. This expression of curiosity gave her face the look of a wooden, roughly painted doll. Yes, that's bad, repeated Agathia with conviction. Terribly bad. Well, said Fiducia, the ludicrous expression of curiosity on her face becoming more emphatic. She'll hide and hide and hide away, said Agathia, 
in a mysterious whisper, as she looked cautiously toward the door. "'What are you saying?' exclaimed Fiducia, frightened. "'It's the truth I'm saying. Remember my words,' Agathia went on with the same assurance and secrecy. "'It's the surest sign.' The old woman had invented this sign, quite suddenly herself, and she was evidently very proud of it. 3. Lelechka was asleep, and Serafima Alexandrovna was sitting in her own room, thinking with joy and tenderness of Lelechka. Lelechka was in her thoughts, first a sweet, tiny girl, then a sweet, big girl, then again a delightful little girl, and so until the end she remained Mama's little Lelechka. Serafima Alexandrovna did not even notice that Fedusia came up to her and paused before her. Fedusia had a worried, frightened look. Berinya, Berinya, she said quietly, in a trembling voice. Serafima Alexandrovna gave a start. Fedusia's face made her anxious. What is it, Fedusia? she asked with great concern. Is there anything wrong with Lelechka? No, Berinya, said Fedusia as she gesticulated with her hands to reassure her mistress, and to make her sit down. Lelechka is asleep. May God be with her. Only I'd like to say something, you see. Lelechka is always hiding herself. That's not good. Fedusia looked at her mistress with fixed eyes, which had grown round from fright. Why not good? asked Serafima Alexandrovna, with vexation, succumbing involuntarily to vague fears. I can't tell you how bad it is, said Fedusia, and her face expressed the most decided confidence. Please speak in a sensible way, observed Serafima Alexandrovna dryly. I understand nothing of what you're saying. You see, Berinya, it's a kind of omen, explained Fedusia abruptly, in a shamefaced way. Nonsense, said Serafima Alexandrovna. She did not wish to hear any further as to the sort of omen it was, and what it foreboded. But, somehow, a sense of fear and of sadness crept into her mood, and it was humiliating to feel that an absurd tale should disturb her beloved fancies, and should agitate her so deeply. Of course I know that gentlefolk don't believe in omens, but it's a bad omen, Berinia, Fiducia went on in a doleful voice. A young lady will hide and hide— Suddenly she burst into tears, sobbing out loudly, "'She'll hide and hide and hide away, angelic little soul, in a damp grave,' she continued, as she wiped her tears with her apron, and blew her nose. "'Who told you all this?' asked Serafima Alexandrovna in an austere low voice. "'Agathia says so, Berinya, answered Fedusia. "'It's she that knows—knows!' Knows! exclaimed Serafima Alexandrovna in irritation, as though she wished to protect herself somehow from this sudden anxiety. What nonsense! Please don't come to me with any such notions in the future. Now you may go. Fiducia, dejected, her feelings hurt, left her mistress. What nonsense! As though Lelechka could die, thought Serafima Alexandrovna to herself, trying to conquer the feeling of coldness and fear which took possession of her, at the thought of the possible death of Lelechka. Serafima Alexandrovna, upon reflection, attributed these women's beliefs in omens to ignorance. She saw clearly that there could be no possible connection between a child's quite ordinary diversion and the continuation of the child's life. She made a special effort that evening to occupy her mind with other matters, but her thoughts returned involuntarily to the fact that Lelechka loved to hide herself. When Lelechka was still quite small, and had learned to distinguish between her mother and her nurse, she sometimes, sitting in her nurse's arms, made a sudden roguish grimace, and hid her laughing face in the nurse's shoulder. Then she would look out, with a sly glance. Of late, in those rare moments of the Berinia's absence from the nursery, Fedusia had again taught Lelechka to hide and when Lelechka's mother, on coming in, saw how lovely the child looked when she was hiding, she herself began to play hide-and-seek with her tiny daughter. 
4. The next day, Serafima Alexandrovna, absorbed in her joyous cares for Lelechka, had forgotten Fedusia's words of the day before. But when she returned to the nursery, after having ordered the dinner, and she heard Lelechka suddenly cry, Tew, tew! from under the table, a feeling of fear suddenly took hold of her. Though she reproached herself at once for this unfounded, superstitious dread, nevertheless she could not enter wholeheartedly into the spirit of Lelechka's favourite game, and she tried to divert Lelechka's attention to something else. Lelechka was a lovely and obedient child. She eagerly complied with her mother's new wishes. But as she had got into the habit of hiding from her mother in some corner, and of crying out, Tew, tew, so even that day she returned more than once to the game. Serafima Alexandrovna tried desperately to amuse Lelechka. This was not so easy, because restless, threatening thoughts obtruded themselves constantly. Why does Lelechka keep on recalling the tutu? Why does she not get tired of the same thing, of eternally closing her eyes and of hiding her face? Perhaps, thought Serafima Alexandrovna, she is not as strongly drawn to the world as other children, who are attracted by many things. If this is so, is it not a sign of organic weakness? Is it not a germ of the unconscious non-desire to live? Serafima Alexandrovna was tormented by presentiments. She felt ashamed of herself for ceasing to play hide-and-seek with Lelechka before Fedusia. But this game had become agonizing to her, all the more agonizing because she had a real desire to play it, and because something drew her very strongly to hide herself from Lelechka and to seek out the hiding child. Serafima Alexandrovna herself began the game once or twice, though she played it with a heavy heart. She suffered as though committing an evil deed with full consciousness. It was a sad day for Serafima Alexandrovna. 5. Lelechka was about to fall asleep. No sooner had she climbed into her little bed, protected by a network on all sides, then her eyes began to close from fatigue. Her mother covered her with a blue blanket. Lelechka drew her sweet little hands from under the blanket, and stretched them out to embrace her mother. Her mother bent down. Lelechka, with a tender expression on her sleepy face, kissed her mother and let her head fall on the pillow. As her hands hid themselves under the blanket, Lelechka whispered, The hands, tew, tew! The mother's heart seemed to stop. Lelechka lay there so small, so frail, so quiet. Lelechka smiled gently, closed her eyes, and said quietly, The eyes, tew, tew. Then even more quietly, Lelechka, tew, tew. With these words she fell asleep, her face pressing the pillow. She seemed so small and so frail under the blanket that covered her. Her mother looked at her with sad eyes. Serafima Alexandrovna remained standing over Lelechka's bed a long while, and she kept looking at Lelechka with tenderness and fear. I'm a mother. Is it possible that I shouldn't be able to protect her? She thought, as she imagined the various ills that might befall Lelechka. She prayed long that night, but the prayer did not relieve her sadness. 6. Several days passed. Lelechka caught cold. The fever came upon her at night, when Serafima Alexandrovna, awakened by Fedusia, came to Lelechka and saw her looking so hot, so restless, and so tormented, she instantly recalled the evil omen, and a hopeless despair took possession of her from the first moments. A doctor was called, and everything was done that is usual on such occasions. But— the inevitable happened. Serafima Alexandrovna tried to console herself with the hope that Lelechka would get well, and would again laugh and play, yet this seemed to her an unthinkable happiness, and Lelechka grew feebler from hour to hour. All simulated tranquillity, so as not to frighten Serafima Alexandrovna, but their masked faces only made her sad. 
Nothing made her so unhappy as the reiterations of Fiducia uttered between sobs. She hid herself and hid herself, our Lelechka. But the thoughts of Serafima Alexandrovna were confused, and she could not quite grasp what was happening. Fever was consuming Lelechka, and there were times when she lost consciousness and spoke in delirium. But when she returned to herself, she bore her pain and her fatigue with gentle good nature. She smiled feebly at her mamachka, so that her mamachka should not see how much she suffered. Three days passed, torturing like a nightmare. The lechka grew quite feeble. She did not know that she was dying. She glanced at her mother with her dimmed eyes, and lisped in a scarcely audible, hoarse voice, Tew tew, mamachka, make tew tew, mamachka. Serafima Alexandrovna hid her face behind the curtains near Lelechka's bed. How tragic! Mamachka! called Lelechka in an almost inaudible voice. Lelechka's mother bent over her, and Lelechka, her vision grown still more dim, saw her mother's pale, despairing face for the last time. A white mamachka! whispered Lelechka. Mamachka's white face became blurred and everything grew dark before Lelechka. She caught the edge of the bed cover feebly with her hands, and whispered, Tew, tew. Something rattled in her throat. Lelechka opened and again closed her rapidly paling lips, and died. Serafima Alexandrovna was in dumb despair as she left Lelechka, and went out of the room. She met her husband. Lelechka is dead she said in a quiet, dull voice. Sergei Modestovich looked anxiously at her pale face. He was struck by the strange stupor in her formerly animated, handsome features. 7. Lelechka was dressed, placed in a little coffin, and carried into the parlour. Serafima Alexandrovna was standing by the coffin, and looking dully at her dead child. Sergei Modestovich went to his wife and, consoling her with cold, empty words, tried to draw her away from the coffin. Serafima Alexandrovna smiled. Go away, she said quietly. Lelechka is playing. She'll be up in a minute. Seema, my dear, don't agitate yourself, said Sergei Modestovich in a whisper. You must resign yourself to your fate. She'll be up in a minute persisted Serafima Alexandrovna, her eyes fixed on the dead little girl. Sergei Modestovich looked round him cautiously. He was afraid of the unseemly and of the ridiculous. Seema, don't agitate yourself, he repeated. This would be a miracle, and miracles do not happen in the nineteenth century. No sooner had he said these words than Sergei Modestovich felt their irrelevance to what had happened. He was confused, and annoyed. He took his wife by the arm, and cautiously led her away from the coffin. She did not oppose him. Her face seemed tranquil, and her eyes were dry. She went into the nursery, and began to walk round the room, looking into those places where Lelechka used to hide herself. She walked all about the room, and bent now and then to look under the table or under the bed, and kept on repeating cheerfully, "'Where is my little one?' Where is my Lelechka? After she had walked round the room once, she began to make her quest anew. Fedusia, motionless, with dejected face, sat in a corner, and looked frightened at her mistress. Then she suddenly burst out sobbing, and she wailed loudly. She hid herself, and hid herself, our Lelechka, our angelic little soul. Serafima Alexandrovna trembled, paused, cast a perplexed look at Fedusia, began to weep, and left the nursery quietly. Eight. Sergei Modestovich hurried the funeral. He saw that Serafima Alexandrovna was terribly shocked by her sudden misfortune, and as he feared for her reason, he thought she would more readily be diverted and consoled when Lelechka was buried. Next morning, Serafima Alexandrovna dressed with particular care for Lelechka. 
when she entered the parlour, there were several people between her and Lelechka. The priest and deacon paced up and down the room. Clouds of blue smoke drifted in the air, and there was a smell of incense. There was an oppressive feeling of heaviness in Seraphima Alexandrovna's head as she approached Lelechka. Lelechka lay there still and pale, and smiled pathetically. Seraphima Alexandrovna laid her cheek upon the edge of Lelechka's coffin, and whispered, "'Tew, tew, little one.' The little one did not reply. Then there was some kind of stir and confusion around Seraphima Alexandrovna. Strange, unnecessary faces bent over her. Someone held her, and Lelechka was carried away somewhere. Seraphima Alexandrovna stood up erect, sighed in a lost way, smiled, and called loudly, Lelechka! Lelechka was being carried out. The mother threw herself after the coffin with despairing sobs, but she was held back. She sprang behind the door, through which Lelechka had passed, sat down there on the floor, and as she looked through the crevice, she cried out, Lelechka! Tew, tew! Then she put her head out from behind the door, and began to laugh. Lelechka was quickly carried away from her mother, and those who carried her seemed to run rather than to walk. THE INVOKER OF THE BEAST by Fyodor Sologub 1. It was quiet and tranquil, and neither joyous nor sad. There was an electric light in the room. The wall seemed impregnable. The window was overhung by heavy, dark green draperies, even denser in tone than the green of the wallpaper. Both doors, the large one at the side and the small one in the depth of the alcove that faced the window, were securely bolted, and there, behind them, reigned darkness and desolation in the broad corridor, as well as in the spacious and cold reception room, where melancholy plants yearned for their native soil. Gurov was lying on the divan. A book was in his hands. He often paused in his reading. He meditated and mused during these pauses, and it was always about the same thing. Always about them. They hovered near him. This he had noticed long ago. They were hiding. Their manner was importunate. They rustled very quietly. For a long time they remained invisible to the eye. But one day, when Gurov awoke rather tired, Sad and pale, and languidly turned on the electric light to dissipate the greyish gloom of an early winter morning, he espied one of them suddenly. Small, grey, shifty and nimble, he flashed by, and in the twinkling of an eye disappeared. And thereafter, in the morning or in the evening, Gurov grew used to seeing these small, shifty house sprites run past him. This time he did not doubt that they would appear. To begin with, he felt a slight headache, afterwards a sudden flash of heat, then of cold. Then, out of the corner, there emerged the long, slender fever, with her ugly yellow face and her bony dry hands. She lay down at his side, and embraced him, and fell to kissing him and to laughing. And these rapid kisses of the affectionate and cunning fever, and these slow approaches of the slight headache, were agreeable. Feebleness spread itself over, the whole body, and lassitude also. This, too, was agreeable. It made him feel as though all the turmoil of life had receded into the distance. And people also became far away, unimportant, even unnecessary. He preferred to be with these quiet ones, these house sprites. Gurov had not been out for some days. He had locked himself in at home. He did not permit anyone to come to him. He was alone. He thought about them. He awaited them. 2. This tedious waiting was cut short in a strange and unexpected manner. He heard the slamming of a distant door, and presently he became aware of the sound of unhurried footfalls which came from the direction of the reception room, just behind the door of his room. Someone was approaching with a sure and nimble step. 
Gurov turned his head toward the door. A gust of cold entered the room. Before him stood a boy, most strange and wild in aspect. He was dressed in linen draperies, half-nude, barefoot, smooth-skinned, sun-tanned, with black tangled hair and dark, burning eyes. An amazingly perfect, handsome face, handsome to a degree which made it terrible to gaze upon its beauty, and it portrayed neither good nor evil. Gurov was not astonished. A masterful mood took hold of him. He could hear the house sprites scampering away to conceal themselves. The boy began to speak. Arista Marshon, perhaps you have forgotten your promise. Is this the way of valiant men? You left me when I was in mortal danger. You had made me a promise, which it is evident you did not intend to keep. I have sought for you such a long time, and here I have found you, living at your ease and in luxury. Gurov fixed a perplexed gaze upon the half-nude, handsome lad, and turgid memories awoke in his soul. Something long since submerged arose in dim outlines and tormented his memory, which struggled to find a solution to the strange apparition. A solution, moreover, which seemed so near and so intimate. And what of the invincibility of his walls? Something had happened round him, some mysterious transformation had taken place. But Gurov, engulfed in his vain exertions to recall something very near to him, and yet slipping away in the tenacious embrace of ancient memory, had not yet succeeded in grasping the nature of the change that he felt had taken place. He turned to the wonderful boy. "'Tell me, gracious boy, simply and clearly, without unnecessary reproaches, what had I promised you?' And when had I left you in a time of mortal danger? I swear to you, by all the holies, that my conscience could never have permitted me such a mean action as you reproach me with. The boy shook his head. In a sonorous voice, suggestive of the melodious outpouring of a stringed instrument, he said, Arista Marchion, you always have been a man skilful with words, and not less skilful in matters requiring daring and prudence. If I have said that you left me in a moment of mortal danger, I did not intend it as a reproach, and I do not understand why you speak of your conscience. Our projected affair was difficult and dangerous, but who can hear us now, before whom, with your craftily arranged words and your dissembling ignorance of what happened this morning at sunrise, can you deny that you had given me a promise? The electric light grew dim. The ceiling seemed to darken— and to recede into height. There was a smell of grass. Its forgotten name, once, long ago, suggested something gentle and joyous. A breeze blew. Gurov raised himself, and asked, What sort of an affair had we two contrived? Gracious boy, I deny nothing. Only I don't know what you are speaking of. I don't remember. Gurov felt as though the boy were looking at him, yet not directly. He felt also vaguely conscious of another presence, no less unfamiliar and alien than that of this curious stranger, and it seemed to him that the unfamiliar form of this other presence coincided with his own form. An ancient soul, as it were, had taken possession of Gurov, and enveloped him in the long-lost freshness of its vernal attributes. It was growing darker, and there was increasing purity and coolness in the air. There rose up in his soul the joy and ease of pristine existence. The stars glowed brilliantly in the dark sky. The boy spoke. We had undertaken to kill the beast. I tell you this under the multitudinous gaze of the all-seeing sky. Perhaps you were frightened. That's quite likely, too. We had planned a great, terrible affair that our names might be honoured by future generations. Soft, Tranquil and monotonous was the sound of a stream which purled its way in the nocturnal silence. The stream was invisible, but its nearness was soothing and refreshing. They stood under the broad shelter of a tree, and continued the conversation began at some other time. Gurov asked, "'Why do you say that I had left you in a moment of mortal danger? Who am I that I should be frightened and run away?' The boy burst into a laugh. 
His mirth had the sound of music, and as it passed into speech, his voice still quavered with sweet, melodious laughter. Arista Marshawn, how cleverly you feign to have forgotten all! I don't understand what makes you do this, and with such a mastery that you bring reproaches against yourself which I have not even dreamt of. You had left me in a moment of mortal danger because it had to be, and you could not have helped me otherwise than by forsaking me at the moment. You will surely not remain stubborn in your denial when I remind you of the words of the oracle. Gurov suddenly remembered. A brilliant light, as it were, unexpectedly illumined the dark domain of things forgotten. And in wild ecstasy, in a loud and joyous voice, he exclaimed, One shall kill the beast. The boy laughed, and Arista Marshon asked, Did you kill the beast, Timorides? With what? exclaimed Timorides. However strong my hands are, I was not one who could kill the beast with a blow of the fist. We, Arista Marchon, had not been prudent, and we were unarmed. We were playing in the sand by the stream. The beast came upon us suddenly, and he laid his paw upon me. It was for me to offer up my life as a sweet sacrifice to glory, and to a noble cause. It was for you to execute our plan. And while he was tormenting my defenceless and unresisting body, you, fleet-footed Aristomarchon, could have run for your lance, and killed the now blood-intoxicated beast. But the beast did not accept my sacrifice. I lay under him, quiescent and still, gazing into his bloodshot eyes. He held his heavy paw on my shoulder. His breath came in hot, uneven gasps, and he sent out low snarls. Afterwards, he put out his huge, hot tongue and licked my face. Then he left me. Where is he now? asked Arista Marchon, in a voice strangely tranquil and strangely sonorous in the quiet, arrested stillness of the humid air, Timorides replied. He followed me. I do not know how long I have been wandering until I found you. He followed me. I led him on by the smell of my blood. I do not know why he has not touched me until now, but here I have enticed him to you. You had better get the weapon which you had hidden so carefully and kill the beast, while I, in my turn, will leave you in the moment of mortal danger, eye to eye with the enraged creature. Here's luck to you, Arista Marchon. As soon as he uttered these words, Timorides started to run. For a short time, his cloak was visible in the darkness, a glimmering patch of white, and then he disappeared. In the same instant, the air resounded with the savage bellowing of the beast, and his ponderous tread became audible. Pushing aside the growth of shrubs, there emerged from the darkness the huge, monstrous head of the beast, flashing a livid fire out of its two enormous flaming eyes. And in the dark silence of nocturnal trees, the towering, ferocious shape of the beast loomed ominously as it approached Arista Marchon. Terror filled Arista Marchon's heart. Where is the lance? was the thought that quickly flashed across his brain. And in that instant, feeling the fresh night breeze on his face, Arista Marchon realized that he was running from the beast. His ponderous springs and his spasmodic roars resounded closer and closer behind him. And as the beast came up with them, a loud cry rent the silence of the night. The cry came from Arista Marchon, who, recalling then some ancient and terrible words, pronounced loudly the incantation of the walls. And thus enchanted, the walls erected themselves around him. 3. Enchanted, the walls stood firm and were lit up. A dreary light was cast upon them by the dismal electric lamp. Gurov was in his usual surroundings. Again came the nimble fever, and kissed him with her yellow, dry lips, and caressed him with her dry, bony hands, which exhaled heat and cold. The same thin volume, with its white pages, lay on the little table beside the divan where, as before, Gurov rested in the caressing embrace of the affectionate fever, who showered upon him her rapid kisses. 
and again there stood beside him, laughing and rustling, the tiny house sprites. Gurov said loudly and indifferently, The incantation of the walls! Then he paused. But in what consisted this incantation? He had forgotten the words, or had they never existed at all? The little shifty, grey demons danced round the slender volume with its ghostly white pages, and kept on repeating with their rustling voices, Our walls are strong. We are in the walls. We have nothing to fear from the outside. In their midst stood one of them, a tiny object like themselves, yet different from the rest. He was all black. His mantle fell from his shoulders in folds of smoke and flame. His eyes flashed like lightning. Terror and joy alternated quickly. Gurov spoke. Who are you? The black demon answered. I am the invoker of the beast. In one of your long past existences you left the lacerated body of Timorides on the banks of a forest stream. The beast had satiated himself on the beautiful body of your friend. He had gorged himself on the flesh that might have partaken of the fullness of earthly happiness. A creature of superhuman perfection had perished in order to gratify for a moment the appetite of the ravenous and ever insatiable beast, and the blood, the wonderful blood, the sacred wine of happiness and joy, the wine of superhuman bliss, what had been the fate of this wonderful blood? Alas, the thirsty, ceaselessly thirsty beast drank of it to gratify his momentary desire, and is thirsty anew. You had left the body of Timorides, mutilated by the beast, on the banks of the forest stream. You forgot the promise you had given your valorous friend, and even the words of the ancient oracle had not banished fear from your heart. And do you think that you are safe, that the beast will not find you? There was austerity in the sound of his voice. While he was speaking, the house sprites gradually ceased their dance. The little grey house sprite stopped to listen to the invoker of the beast. Gurov then said in reply, I am not worried about the beast. I have pronounced eternal enchantment upon my walls, and the beast shall never penetrate hither into my enclosure. The little grey ones were overjoyed. Their voices tinkled with merriment and laughter. Having gathered round, hand in hand, in a circle, they were on the point of bursting forth once more into dance, when the voice of the invoker of the beast rang out again, sharp and austere. But I am here. I am here because I have found you. I am here because the incantation of the walls is dead. I am here because Timorides is waiting and importuning me. Do you hear the gentle laugh of the brave, trusting lad? Do you hear the terrible bellowing of the beast? From behind the wall, approaching nearer, could be heard the fearsome bellowing of the beast. The beast is bellowing behind the wall, the invincible wall, exclaimed Gurov in terror. My walls are enchanted for ever, and impregnable against foes. Then spoke the black demon, and there was an imperious ring in his voice. I tell you, man, the incantation of the walls is dead, and if you think you can save yourself by pronouncing the incantation of the walls, why then don't you utter the words? A cold shiver passed down Gurov's spine. The incantation! He had forgotten the words of the ancient spell. And what mattered it? Was not the ancient incantation dead? Dead? Everything about him confirmed with irrefutable evidence the death of the ancient incantation of the walls. Because the walls, and the light and the shade which fell upon them, seemed dead and wavering. The invoker of the beast spoke terrible words. And Gurov's mind was now in a whirl, now in pain, and the affectionate fever did not cease to torment him with her passionate kisses. Terrible words resounded, almost deadening his senses, while the invoker of the beast grew larger and larger, and hot fumes breathed from him, and grim terror. His eyes ejected fire, and when at last he grew so tall as to screen off the electric light, 
His black cloak suddenly fell from his shoulders. Gurov recognized him. It was the boy Timurides. Will you kill the beast? asked Timurides in a sonorous voice. I've enticed him. I've led him to you. I've destroyed the incantation of the wars. The cowardly gift of inimical gods, the incantation of the walls, had turned into naught my sacrifice, and had saved you from your action. But the ancient incantation of the walls is dead. Be quick, then, to take hold of your sword and kill the beast. I've been a boy. I've become the invoker of the beast. He had drunk of my blood, and now he thirsts anew. He had partaken also of my flesh, and he is hungry again. The insatiable, pitiless beast! I have called him to you, and you, in fulfilment of your promise, may kill the beast, or die yourself. He vanished. A terrible bellowing shook the walls. A gust of icy moisture blew across to Gurov. The wall facing the spot where Gurov lay opened, and the huge, ferocious, and monstrous beast entered bellowing savagely. He approached Gurov and laid his ponderous paw upon his breast. Straight into his heart plunged the pitiless claws. A terrible pain shot through his whole body. Shifting his blood-red eyes, the beast inclined his head toward Gurov, and, crumbling the bones of his victim with his teeth, began to devour his yet palpitating heart. The Uniter of Souls by Fyodor Sologub Garmanov was extremely young, and had not yet learnt to time his visits. He usually came at the wrong hour, and did not know when to leave. He realised at last that he was boring St. Polyev almost to madness. It dawned upon him that he was taking St. Polyev from his work. He recalled that St. Polyev had borne himself with a constrained politeness toward him, and that at times a caustic phrase escaped his lips. Garmanov grew painfully red. A sudden flame spread itself under the smooth skin of his drawn cheeks. He rose irresolutely. Then he sat down again, for he saw that St. Polyev was about to say something. St. Polyev took up the thread of the conversation in a depressed voice. So you've put a mask on. What do you want me to understand by that? Garmanov muttered in a confused way. It's necessary to dissemble sometimes. St. Polyev would not listen further, but gave way to his irritation. What do you understand about it? What do you know of masks? There is no mask without a responding soul. It is impossible to put on a mask without harmonizing your soul with its soul. Otherwise, the mask is uncovered. St. Polyev grew silent, and looked miserably before him. He did not look at Garmanov. He felt again a strange, instinctive hate for him, such as he felt at their first meeting. He had always tried to hide this hate under a mask of great heartiness. He had urged Garmanov most earnestly to visit him, and praised Garmanov's verses to everyone. But from time to time he spoke coarse, malicious words to the timid young man, who then flushed violently and shrank back within himself. St. Polyev was quick to pity him, but soon again he detested his cautious, sluggish ways. He thought him secretive and cunning. Garmanov rose, said goodbye, and went out. St. Polyev was left alone. He felt miserable because his work had been interrupted. He no longer felt in the same working mood. A secret malice tormented him. Why should this seemingly insignificant youth, Garmanov, evoke such bitterness in him? He had a large mouth, a long, very smooth face. His movements were slow, his voice had a drawl. There was something ambiguous about him, and enigmatical. St. Polyev began sadly to pace the room. He stopped before the wall, and began to speak. There are many people nowadays who have long conversations with the wall— the wall, indeed, makes an interested interlocutor, and a faithful one. It is possible, he said, to hate so strongly and so poignantly only that which is near to one. But in what does this devilish nearness consist? 
By what impure magic has some demon bound our souls together, souls so unlike one another? Mine, that of a man of action, with a bent for repose, and his, the soul of a large-mouthed fledgling, who is as cunning as a conspirator, and as cautious as a coward. And what is there in his character, that conflicts so strangely with his appearance, who has stolen the best and most needful part from this Molly Coddle's soul? He spoke quietly, almost in a murmur. Then he exclaimed, as though in a rage, Who has done this? Man, or the enemy of men? And he heard the strange answer. I. Someone spoke this word in a clear, shrill voice. It was like the sharp yet subdued ring of rusty steel. St. Poliev trembled nervously. He looked round him. There was no one in the room. He sat down in the armchair and looked, scowling on the table, buried under books and papers. And he waited. He awaited something. The waiting grew painful. He said loudly, "'Well, why do you hide? You've begun to speak. You might as well appear. What do you wish to say? What is it?' He began to listen intently. His nerves were strained. It seemed as though the slightest noise would have sounded like an archangel's trumpet. Then there was sudden laughter. It was sharp, and it was like the sound of rusty metal. The spring of some elaborate toy seemed to unwind itself, and trembled and tinkled in the subdued quiet of the evening. St. Poliev put the palms of his hands over his temples, and rested upon his elbows. He listened intently. The laugh died away with mechanical evenness. It was evident that it came from somewhere quite near, perhaps from the table itself. St. Poliev waited. He gazed with intent eyes at the bronze inkstand. He asked derisively, Ink Sprite, was it not you that laughed? The sharp voice, quite unlike the muffled voice of phantoms, answered with the same derision, No, you are mistaken, and you are not very brilliant. I am not an ink sprite. Don't you know the rustling voices of ink sprites? You are a poor observer. And again there was laughter. Again the rusty spring tinkled as it unwound itself. St. Poliev said, I don't know who you are, and how should I know? I cannot see you. Only I think that you're like the rest of your fraternity. You're always near us. You poke your noses into everything, and you bring sadness and evil spells upon us. Yet you dare not show yourselves before our eyes. The metallic voice replied, The fact is, I came to have a talk with you. I love to talk with such as yourself, with half-folk. The voice grew silent, and St. Poliev waited for it to laugh. He thought, he must punctuate his every phrase with that hideous laughter. Indeed, he was not mistaken. The strange visitor really talked in this way. First he would speak a few words, then he would burst out into a sharp, rusty laughter. It seemed as though he used his words to wind up the spring, and that later the spring relaxed itself with his laughter. And while his laughter was still dying away with mechanical evenness, the guest showed himself from behind the inkstand. He was small, and was no taller from head to foot than the fourth finger. He was grey steel in colour. Owing to his small stature, and to his rapid movements, it was hard to tell whether the dim glow came from the body, or from a garment that stretched lightly over it. In any case, it was something smooth, something expressly simple. The body seemed like a slender keg, broader at the belt, narrower at the shoulders and below. The arms and legs were of equal length and thickness, and of like nimbleness and flexibility. It seemed as though the arms were very long and thick, and the legs disproportionately short and thin. The neck was short. The face was hardy. The legs were widely astride. At the end of the back, something was visible in the nature of a tail or a thick cone, like growths were upon the sides, under the elbows. The strange figure moved quickly, nimbly, and surely. The monster sat down on the bronze ridge of the inkstand, pushing aside the wooden penholder with his foot, in order to be more comfortable. He grew quiet. St. Poliev examined his face. 
It was lean, grey, and smooth. His eyes were small and glowed brightly. His mouth was large. His ears stuck out and were pointed at the top. He sat there, grasping the ridge with his hands, like a monkey. St. Paulia asked, Gracious guest, what do you want to say to me? And in answer, a slight voice, mechanically even, unpleasantly sharp, and rather rusty in tone, made itself heard. Man with a single head and a single soul, recall your past, your primitive experience of those ancient days, when you and he lived in the same body. And again there was laughter, shrill and sharp, piercing the ear. While he was still laughing, the guest, with mechanical agility, turned a somersault. He stood on his hands, and St. Poliev saw for the first time what he had taken for a tail was really a second head. This head did not differ in any way, as far as he could see, from the other head. Whether the heads were too small for him to observe, or whether the heads did not actually differ, it was quite certain that St. Poliev did not see the slightest distinction between them. The arms reversed themselves as on hinges, and became quite like the legs. The first head, then losing its colour, hid itself between these arm legs, while the former legs reversed themselves mechanically, and became the arms. St. Poliev looked at his strange guest with astonishment. The guest made wry faces, and danced. And when at last he grew still, and his laughter gradually died away, the second head began to speak. How many souls have you, and how many consciousnesses? Can you tell me that? You pride yourself on the amazing differentiation of your organs. You have an idea that each member of your body fulfills its own well-defined functions. But tell me, stupid man, have you anything whereby to preserve the memory of your previous existences? The other head contains the rest of you, your early memories and your earlier experience. You argue subtly and craftily across the threshold of your pitiful consciousness, but your misfortune is that you have only one head. The guest burst out again into rusty metallic laughter, and he laughed this time rather long. He laughed, and he danced at the same time. He turned somersaults, or he rested upon one arm and upon one leg, thereby causing one of his sides to turn upward until it was impossible to distinguish any of his four extremities. Afterwards, his limbs again turned mechanically, and it became obvious that the growths on his sides were also heads. Each head spoke and laughed in its turn. Each head grimaced, mocked at him. St. Poliev exclaimed in great fury, Be silent! The guest danced, shouted, and laughed. St. Poliev thought, I must catch him and crush him or I must smash the monster with a blow of the heavy press. But the guest continued to laugh and to make wry faces. I dare not take him with my hands, thought St. Pulyev. He might burn or scorch me. A knife would be better. He opened his penknife. Then he quickly directed its sharp point toward the middle of his guest's body. The four-headed monster gathered himself into a ball, flapped his four paws, and burst into piercing laughter. St. Poliev threw his knife on the table, and exclaimed, "'Hateful monster! What do you want of me?' The guest jumped upon the sharply pointed lid of the inkstand, perched himself upon one foot, stretched his arms upward, and exclaimed in an ugly, shrill voice, "'Man with one head, recall your remote past, when you and he were in the same body, the time you shared together in a dangerous adventure.' Recall the dance of that terrible hour. Suddenly, it grew dark. The laughter resounded, hoarse and hideous. The head was going round. Light columns moved forward out of the darkness. The ceiling was low. The torches glowed dimly. The red tongues of flame wavered in the scented air. The flute poured out its notes. Handsome young limbs moved in measure to its music and it seemed to St. Poliev that he was young and powerful, and that he was dancing round a banqueting table. A shriveled, insolent, drunken face was looking at him. The banqueter was laughing uproariously. He was happy, and the dance of the half-naked youths pleased him. 
St. Polia felt that her furious rage was strangling him, and was hindering him from carrying out his project. He danced past the carousing man, and his hands trembled. A reddish mist of hate dimmed his sight. His second soul wakened at the same time. It was the cunning, the sidling, the feline soul. This time, the youth smiled at the happy man. He floated gracefully past him, a sweet, gentle boy. The banqueter laughed loudly. The youth's naked limbs and bared torso cheered the lord of the feast. And again there was hate, which dimmed his eyes with a red haze, and caused his hands to tremble with fury. Someone whispered angrily, "'Are we going to twirl so long fruitlessly? It is time! It is time! Put an end to it!' The friendly spirits prevailed. The two souls flowed together. Hate and cunning became one. There was a light, floating movement, then a powerful stroke. Nimble feet swept the youth into the swift, beautiful dance. There was a hoarse outcry, then an uproar. Everything became confused. And again, there was darkness. St. Paul awoke. The same small monster was dancing on the table, grimacing and laughing uproariously. St. Pulyev asked, "'What's the meaning of this?' His guest replied, Two souls once dwelt in this youth, and one of them is now yours. It is a soul of exultant emotions and of passionate desires. It is an ever-insatiable, trembling soul.' Then there was laughter, jarring on the ear. The monster danced on. St. Pulyev shouted, "'Stop, you dance-devil! It seems to me you wish to say that the second soul of this primitive youth lives in the feeble body of this despicable, smooth-faced youngster?' The guest stopped laughing, and exclaimed, "'Man, you have at last understood what I wish to tell you. Now perhaps you will guess who I am, and why I have come.' St. Pulyev waited until the trembling, shrill laughter ceased and he answered his guest, "'You are the uniter of souls. But why did you not join us at our birth?' The monster hissed, curled up, then stopped and threw upward one of his side-heads, and exclaimed, "'We can repair this if you like. Do you wish it?' "'I wish it,' St. Pulyev replied quickly. "'Call him to you on New Year's Eve, and call me. This hair will enable you to summon me.' The monster ran quickly to the lamp, and placing upon its stand a short, thin black hair, continued speaking. "'When you light it, I'll come. But you ought to know that neither you nor he will preserve afterward a separate existence, and the man who will depart from here shall contain both souls, but it will be neither you nor he.' Then he disappeared. His shrill, rusty laughter still resounded and tormented the ear but St. Polyev no longer saw anyone before him. Only a black hair on the flat stand of the lamp reminded him of his guest. St. Polyev took the hair and put it into his purse. The last day of the year was approaching midnight. Garmanov was sitting once more at St. Polyev's. They spoke quietly, in subdued voices. It was painful. St. Polyev asked, You do not regret coming to my lonely party. The smooth-faced young man smiled, and this made his teeth seem very white. He drawled out his words very slowly, and what he said was so tedious and so empty that St. Polyev had no desire to listen to him. St. Polyev, without continuing the conversation, asked quite bluntly, "'You remember your earlier existence?' "'Not very well,' answered Garmanov. It was clear that he did not understand the question, and that he thought St. Polyev had asked him about his childhood. St. Polyev frowned in his vexation. He began to explain what he wished to say. He felt that his speech was involved and long, and this vexed him still more. But Garmanov had understood. He grew cheerful. He flushed slightly. His words had a more animated sound than usual. Yes, yes. I sometimes feel that I have lived before. It is such a strange feeling. It's as though that life was fuller, bolder, and freer, and that I dared to do things that I dare not do now. 
And isn't it true, Arsene Poliev, in some agitation, that you feel as though you had lost something, as though you now lack the most significant part of your being? Yes, answered Garmanov with emphasis. That's precisely my feeling. Would you like to restore this missing part? St. Poliev continued to question. To be once more as before whole and bold, to contain in one body which shall feel itself light and young and free, the fullness of life, and the union of the antagonistic identities of our human breed, to be indeed more than whole, to feel as it were in one's breast the beating of a doubled heart, to be this and that, to join two clashing souls within oneself, and to wrest the necessary manhood and hardihood for great deeds from the fiery struggle of intense contradictions. Yes, yes, said Garmanov. I too sometimes dream about this. Sonpolyev was afraid to look at the irresolute, confused, smooth face of his young visitor. He vaguely feared that Garmanov's face would disconcert him. He made haste. Besides, midnight was approaching. Sonpolyev said quietly, I have the means in my hands to realize this dream. Do you wish to have it realized? I should like to, said Garmanov irresolutely. Sonpolyev raised his eyes. He looked at Garmanov with firmness and decision, as though he demanded something urgent and indispensable from him. He looked with a fixed intentness into the dark, youthful eyes, which should have flamed fire, but instead they were the cold, crafty eyes of a little man with half a soul. But it seemed to St. Poliev that under his fixed, fiery gaze, Garmanov's eyes were becoming inflamed with enthusiasm and burning wrath. The young man's smooth face had suddenly become significant and stern. "'Do you wish it?' St. Poliev asked him once more. Garmanov replied quickly, with decision, "'I wish it.' And then a strange, sharp, shrill voice pronounced, "'O oh, small and cunning man! You who once during your ancient existence did a deed of great hardihood! That was when you joined your crafty soul to the flaming soul of an indignant man. Tell us in this great rare hour, have you firmly decided to merge your soul with the other, the different soul? And Garmanov answered even more quickly and more decisively, I wish to. Sonpolyev listened to the shrill voice of the questioner. He recognized him. He was not mistaken. The I wish to of Garmanov had already lost itself in the rusty, metallic laughter of that extraordinary visitor. Sonpolyev waited until the laughter ceased. Then he said, But you should know that you will have to reject all dissembling, and all the joys of separate existence. Once I achieve my magic, we shall both perish, and we shall set free our souls, or rather we shall fuse them together, and there shall be neither I nor you. There will be one in our place, and he shall be fiery in his conception, and cold in his execution. Both of us will have to go, in order to give a place to him, in whom both of us will be united. My friend, have you resolved upon this terrible thing? It is a great and terrible thing. Garmanov smiled a strange, faltering smile, but the fiery glance of St. Polyev extinguished the smile, and the young man, as if submitting to some inevitable and fated command, pronounced in a dim, lifeless voice, I have decided. I wish it. I am not afraid. Sonpolyev took the hair out of his wallet with trembling fingers. He lit a candle. Behind it hid the four-headed visitor. His grey body seemed to quake, and it vacillated in the wavering flame that fondled in its flickering embraces the white body of the submissive candle. Garmanov opened his eyes wide and they steadfastly followed Sempolyev's movements. Sempolyev put one end of the hair to the flame. The hair curled slightly, grew red, gave a flare. It burned very slowly, with a quiet, rhythmic crackle, which resembled the laugh of the nocturnal guest. The words of the strange guest were simple but terrible. At first, Sempolyev was barely conscious of them, he was so agitated and so absorbed by the burning of the magic hair 
that he could see no connection with the simple, familiar words of the monster. Suddenly, terror came upon him. He had understood. There was derision in those simple, terribly simple words. Little soul, failing little soul, timid little soul. St. Poliev, frightened, looked at Garmanov. The smooth-faced young man sat there, strangely shrunken. His face was pale. Beads of perspiration showed on his forehead. A pitiful, forced smile twisted his lips. When he saw that St. Poliev was looking at him, he shrank even more, and whispered in a broken, hollow voice, as though against his will, "'It is terrible. It is painful. It is unnecessary.' Suddenly he hunched like a cat, a cunning, timid, evil cat, and sprang forward. Thus deformed, he pushed out his over-red lips and blew upon the almost consumed hair. The flame flickered upward, trembled, and died. A tiny cloud of blue smoke spread itself in the still air. The shrill laughter of the nocturnal guest pierced the ears. The hideous words resounded. Miscarried miscarried. Garmanov sat down. He smiled guiltily and cunningly. St. Poliev looked at him with unseeing eyes. The clock began to strike in the next room, and to each stroke the uniter of souls responded with the hoarse outcry, miscarried. And he laughed again his metallic laughter like a wound-up spring. He whirled round and grimaced, he seemed to lose himself in the lifeless yellow electric light. At the twelfth stroke, the last voice of the passing year, the hideous voice grew silent, miscarried, and the horrible laughter of the vanishing monster died away. Garmanov, truly rejoicing over his deliverance from an unhappy fate, rose and said, A happy new year! The Glimmer of Hunger by Fyodor Sologub Sergei Matveyevich Moshkin had dined very well that day. That is, comparatively well, when you stop to consider that he was only a village schoolmaster who had lost his place, and had been knocking about already a year or so on strange stairways in search of work. Nevertheless, the glimmer of hunger persisted in his dark, sad eyes and it gave his lean, smooth face a kind of unlooked-for significance. Moshkin spent his last three-rouble note on this dinner, and now a few coppers jingled in his pocket, while his purse contained a smooth fifteen-kopeck piece. He banqueted out of sheer joy. He knew quite well that it was stupid to rejoice prematurely and without sufficient cause. But he had been seeking work so long— and had been having such a time of it, that even the shadow of a hope gave him joy. Moshkin had put an advertisement in the Novo Vremya. He announced himself a pedagogue who had command of the pen. He based his claim on the fact that he corresponded for a provincial newspaper. This, indeed, was why he had lost his place. It was discovered that he had written articles reflecting unfavourably on the authorities. The chief official of the district— called the attention of the inspector of public schools to this, and the inspector, of course, would not brook such doings by any of his staff. "'We don't want that kind,' the inspector said to him in a personal interview. Moshkin asked, "'What kind do you want?' The inspector, without replying to this irrelevant question, remarked dryly, "'Good-bye. I hope to meet you in the next world.' Moshkin stated further in his advertisement that he wished to be a secretary a permanent collaborator on a newspaper, a private tutor. Also, that he was willing to accompany his employer to the Caucasus or the Crimea, and to make himself useful in the house, etc. He gave an assurance of his reasonableness, and that he had no objections to travelling. He waited. One postcard came. It inspired him with hope. He hardly knew why. It came in the morning while Moshkin was drinking his tea— the landlady brought it in herself. There was a glitter in her dark, snake-like eyes, as she remarked tauntingly. Here's some correspondence for Mr. Sergei Matveyevich Moshkin. And while he was reading, 
She smoothed her black hair down her triangular yellow forehead, and hissed, "'What's the good of getting letters? Much better if you paid for your board and lodging. A letter won't feed your hunger. You ought to go among people, look for a job, and not expect things to come to you.' He read, "'Be so good as to come in for a talk, between six and seven in the evening, at row six, house seventy-eight, apartment fifty-seven. There was no signature. Moshkin glanced angrily at his landlady. She was broad and erect, and as she stood there at the door quite calm, with lowered arms, she was like a doll. She seemed deliberately malicious, and she looked at him with her motionless, anger-provoking eyes. Moshkin exclaimed, Basta! He hit the table with his fist. Then he rose and paced up and down the room. He kept on repeating, Basta! The landlady asked quietly and spitefully, Are you going to pay or not, you Kazan and Astrakhan correspondent, you impudent face? Moshkin stopped in front of her, put out his empty palm, and said, That's all I have. He said nothing about his last three-rouble note. The landlady hissed, I'm not hard on you, but I need money. Would seven roubles a load now? How am I to pay it? You can't live on nothing. Can't you find someone to look after you? You're a young man of ability, and you have quite a charming appearance. You can always get hold of some goose or other. But how am I to pay? Whichever way you turn, you've got to put down money. Moshkin replied, Don't worry, Praskovia Petrovna. I'm getting a job tonight, and I'll pay what I owe you. He began to pace the room again making a flapping noise with his slippers. The landlady paused at the door, and kept on with her grumbling. When she went at last, she cried out, "'Another in my place would have shown you the door long ago.' For some time after she had left, there still remained in his memory her strange, erect figure, with relaxed arms. Her broad yellow forehead, shaped like a triangle under her smoothly oiled hair, her worn yellow dress cut away like a narrow triangle, and her red, sniffling nose shaped like a small triangle, three triangles in all. All day long Moshkin was hungry, cheerful, and indignant. He walked aimlessly in the streets. He looked at the girls, and they all seemed to him to be lovable, happy, and accessible to the rich. He stopped before the shop windows, where expensive goods were displayed. The glimmer of hunger in his eyes grew keener and keener. He bought a newspaper. He read as he sat on a form in the square, where the children laughed and ran, where the nurses tried to look fashionable, where there was a smell of dust and of consumptive trees, and where the smells of the street and of the garden mingled unpleasantly, reminding him of the smell of gutta percha. Moshkin was very much struck by an account in the newspaper of a hungry fanatic, who had slashed a picture by a celebrated artist in the museum. Now that's something I can understand. Moshkin walked briskly along the path. He repeated, Now that's something I can understand. And afterwards, as he walked in the streets and looked at the huge and stately houses, at the exposed wealth of the shops, at the elegant dress of the people of fashion, at the swiftly moving carriages, at all these beauties and comforts of life, accessible to all who have money, and inaccessible to him, as he looked and observed and envied, he felt more and more keenly the mood of destructive rage. Now that's something I can understand. He walked up to a stout and pompous house-porter, and shouted, Now that's something I can understand. The porter looked at him with silent scorn. Moshkin laughed joyously, and said, "'Clever chaps, those anarchists!' "'Be off with you!' exclaimed the porter angrily. "'And see that you don't overreach yourself.' Moshkin was about to leave him, but stopped short in fright. There was a policeman quite near, and his white glove stood out with startling sharpness. Moshkin thought, in his sadness, a bomb might come in handy here. The porter spat angrily after him, and turned away. Moshkin walked on. At six o'clock, he entered a restaurant of the middle rank. He chose a table by the window. He had some vodka, and followed it with anchovies. 
he ordered a seventy-five kopeck dinner. He had a bottle of Chablis on ice. After dinner, a liqueur. He got slightly intoxicated. His head went round at the sound of music. He did not take his change. He left, reeling slightly, accompanied respectfully by a porter, into whose hand he stuck a twenty kopeck piece. He looked at his nickeled watch. It was just past seven. It was time to go. He had to make haste. They might hire another. He strode impetuously toward his destination. He was hindered by dug-up pavements, superannuated, eternally somnolent cabbies at street crossings, passers-by, especially moujiks and women, those who came toward him without stepping aside at all, or who stepped aside more often to the left than to the right, or those whom he had to overtake joggled along indifferently on the narrow way, and it was hard to tell at once on which side to pass them. Beggars, these clung to him, and the mechanical process of walking itself. How difficult to conquer space and time when one is in a hurry. Truly the earth drew him to itself, and he purchased every step with violence and exhaustion. He felt pains in his legs. This increased his spite, and intensified the glimmer of hunger in his eyes. Moshkin thought, I'd like to chuck it all to the devil, to all the devils. At last, he got there. Here was the row, and here was house number seventy-eight. It was a four-story house, in a state of neglect. The two approaches had a gloomy look. The gates in the middle stood wide agape. He looked at the plates at the approaches. The first numbers were here, and there was no number fifty-seven. No one was in sight. There was a white button at the gates, and on the brass plate below, buried under dirt, was the word Porter. He pressed the button and entered the gate to look for the directory of the tenants. Before he had got that far, he was met by the porter, a man of insinuating appearance, with a black beard. Where is apartment number fifty-seven? Moshkin asked the question in a careless manner borrowed from the district official who had caused him to lose his place. He also knew from experience that one must address porters just like this and not like that. Wandering in strange gates and on strange staircases gives one a certain polish. The porter asked somewhat suspiciously, "'Who do you want?' Moshkin drawled out his words with artless carelessness. "'I don't exactly know. I've come in answer to an announcement.' I've received a letter, but the name is not signed. Only the address is given. Who lives at number fifty-seven? Madame Engelhardova, said the porter. Engelhardt? asked Moshkin. The porter repeated, Engelhardova. Moshkin smiled. And what's her Russian name? Elena Petrovna, the porter answered. Is she a bad-tempered hag? asked Moshkin for some reason or other. No, she's a young lady, quite stylish. Turn to the right of the gate. Only the first numbers are given there, said Moshkin. The porter said, No, you'll also find fifty-seven there, at the very bottom. Moshkin asked, What does she do? Does she run a business of some sort, a school, or a journal? No, Madame Engelhardover had neither a school nor a journal. She lives on her capital explained the porter. Madame Engelhardover's maid, who looked like a village girl, led him into the drawing-room, to the right of the dark ante-room, and asked him to wait. He waited. It was tedious and annoying. He began to examine the contents of the elaborately furnished room. There were armchairs, tables, stools, folding screens, fire screens, bookshelves, and small columns upon which rested busts, lamps, and artistic gewgaws. There were mirrors, lithographs, and clocks on the walls, while the windows were decorated with hangings and flowers. All these made the room crowded, oppressive, and dark. Moshkin paced through this depression over the rugs. He looked at the pictures and the statues with hate. I'd like to chuck all this to the devil, to all the devils. But when the mistress of the house walked in suddenly, he lowered his eyes and hid his glimmer of hunger. 
She was young, pink, and tall, and quite good-looking. She walked quickly and with decision, like the mistress of a village house, and swung, not altogether gracefully, her strong, handsome white arms bared from above the elbows. She came to him, and held out her hand, a little high, to be pressed or to be kissed, as he chose. He kissed it. There was spite in his kiss. He did it with a quick, resounding smack, and one of his teeth scratched her skin slightly, so that she winced. But she said nothing. She walked toward the divan, got behind the table, and sat down. She showed him an armchair. When he had seated himself, she asked him, Was that your announcement in yesterday's paper? He said, Mine. He reconsidered, and said more politely, Yes, mine. He felt vexed, and he thought to himself, I'd like to send her to the devil. She went on talking. She asked him what he could do, where he had studied, where he had worked. She approached the subject very cautiously, as though afraid to say too much before the proper time. He gathered that she wished to publish a journal. She had not yet decided what sort. Some sort. A small one. She was negotiating for the purchase of a property. Of the nature of the journal, she said nothing. She needed someone for the office. As he had said in his announcement that he was a pedagogue, she thought that he had taught in one of the higher schools. In any case, she wanted someone to keep the books in the office, to receive subscriptions, to carry on the editorial and the office correspondence, to receive money by post, to put the journals in wrappers, to send them to the post, to read proofs and something else, and still something else. The young woman spoke for half an hour. She recounted the various duties in an unintelligent way. "'You need several people for all these tasks,' said Moshkin sharply. The young woman grew red with vexation. She made a wry face as she remarked eagerly, "'The journal will be a small one, of a special nature. If I hired several people for such a small undertaking, they would have nothing to do.' He smiled, and observed, "'Well, anyhow, there'll be no chance for boredom. How many hours a day will you want me to work?' "'Well, let us say from nine in the morning until seven in the evening. Sometimes, when the work is in a hurry, you might remain a little longer, or you might come in on a holiday. I believe you are free. How much do you think of paying? Would eighteen roubles a month be enough for you?' He reflected a while. Then he laughed. "'Too little. I can't afford more than twenty-two very well. He rose suddenly in his rage, thrust his hand into his pocket, drew out the latch-key to his house, and said, quietly but resolutely, "'Hands up!' "'Oh!' exclaimed the young woman, and she quickly raised her arms. She was sitting on the divan. She was pale and trembling. They formed a contrast, she large and strong, and he small and meagre. The sleeves of her dress fell to her shoulders, and the two bare white arms, stretching upward, seemed like the plump legs of a woman acrobat practising at home. She was evidently strong enough to hold up her arms for a long time, but her frightened face betrayed the deep terror of her ordeal. Moshkin, enjoying her plight, uttered slowly and sternly, "'Move if you dare, or give a single whisper.' He approached a picture. "'How much does this cost?' Two hundred and twenty without the frame, said the young woman, in a trembling voice. He searched in his pocket, and found a penknife. He cut the picture from top to bottom, and from right to left. Oh! the young woman cried out. He approached a small marble head. What does this cost? Three hundred. He used his latchkey, and struck off the ear and the nose, and he mutilated the cheeks. The young woman sighed quietly, and it was pleasant to hear her quiet sighing. He cut up a few more pictures, and the armchair coverings, and broke a few of the gewgaws. He then approached the young woman, and exclaimed, "'Get under the divan!' She obeyed. "'Lie there quietly, until someone comes, or else I'll throw a bomb!' He left. He met no one, either in the ante-room or on the stairs. 
The same house-porter stood at the gates. Moshkin went up to him and said, "'What a strange young lady you have in your house. Why? She doesn't know how to behave. She loves a brawl. You had better go to her. No use my going as long as I'm not called. Just as you please.' He left. The glimmer of hunger grew fainter in his eyes. Moshkin continued to walk the streets. His mind realized in a slow, dull way the drawing-room scene, the mutilated pictures, and the young woman under the divan. The dull waters of the canal lured him. The receding light of the setting sun made their surface beautiful and sad, like the music of a mad composer. How rough the stone slabs were on the canal's banks, and how dusty the stones of the pavements, and what stupid and dirty children ran to meet him. Everything seemed shut against him, and everything seemed hostile to him. The green, golden waters of the canal lured him, and the glimmer of hunger in his eyes went out forever. What a noise the swift splash of water made, as, ring after ring, the dead black ring spread out and out, and cut the green-golden waters of the canal. The Smile by Fyodor Sologub. 1. Some fifteen boys and girls, and several young men and women, had gathered in the garden belonging to the Samibi Aronov cottage, to celebrate the birthday of one of the sons of the house, Lisha by name, a student of the second class. Lisha's birthday was made indeed an occasion for bringing eligible young men to the house, for his grown sister's sake. All were merry and smiling, the older members of the party as well as the young boys and girls, who ran up and down the yellow sand of the well-kept footpaths. A pale, unimpressive boy, who was sitting alone on a bench under a lilac bush, and looking silently at the other boys, was also smiling. His loneliness, his silence, and his well-worn though clean clothes, all pointed to his poverty, and to his embarrassment in the company of these lively, well-dressed children. His face was timid and thin, his chest sunken, and his lean hands lay so meekly that it aroused one's pity to look at him. Still, he smiled. But even his smile seemed pitiful. It was as though it depressed him to watch the games and the happiness of other children, or as though he were afraid to annoy others by his sad looks and his poor dress. He was called Grisha Igumnov. His father had died not long ago. Grisha's mother occasionally sent her son to her rich relatives, with whom he always felt depressed and uneasy. "'Why do you sit alone? Get up and run about,' said the blue-eyed Lidochka Samiba Yaranov as she passed him. Grisha did not dare to disobey. His heart beat violently. His face became covered with small beads of perspiration. He approached the happy, red-cheeked boys timidly. They looked at him unfriendly, as at a stranger, and Grisha himself felt at once that he was not like them. He could not speak so boldly and so loudly, and he had neither such yellow boots nor such a round little cap with a woolly red visor turned jauntily upwards as the boy nearest to him had. The boys continued to talk among themselves, as though there were no Grisha. Grisha stood near them in an uneasy pose. His thin shoulders stooped somewhat, his slender fingers held fast to his narrow girdle, and he smiled timidly. He did not know what to do, and in his confusion did not hear what the lively boys were saying. They finished their conversation, and scattered suddenly. Grisha, his timid, guilty smile still on his face, walked back uneasily on the sandy path and sat down once more on the bench. He was ashamed, because he had walked up to the boys, yet had not spoken to any one, and because nothing had come of it. As he sat down, he looked timidly round him. No one paid him the slightest attention, and no one laughed at him. Grisha grew calm. Just then two little girls, their arms round each other, passed him. Under their fixed stare, Grisha shrank, grew red, and smiled guiltily. When the little girls had passed by, the youngest of them, with fair hair, asked loudly, 
Who's this ugly duckling? The elder girl, who was red-cheeked and black-browed, laughed and answered, I don't know. We'd better ask Ledochka. It's most likely a poor relation. What an absurd boy, said the little blonde. He spreads his ears out and sits there and smiles. They disappeared behind the bushes at the turn of the path, and Grisha no longer heard their voices. He felt hurt, and when he thought that he might have to sit there a long time until his mother should come for him, he was sick at heart. A big-eyed, slender student, with a stubborn crest of hair sticking up from his high forehead, noticed that Grisha was sitting alone there like an orphan, and he wished to be kind to him, and to make him feel more at his ease, so he sat down near him. "'What's your name?' he asked. Grisha told him quietly. "'And my name is Mitya,' said the student. "'Are you here alone, or with anyone?' "'With mother,' whispered Grisha. "'Why do you sit here all by yourself?' asked Mitya. Grisha stirred nervously, and did not know what to say. "'Why don't you play?' "'I don't want to.' Mitya did not hear him, so he asked, "'What did you say?' "'I don't feel like it,' said Grisha somewhat more loudly. The student, astonished, continued, "'Why don't you feel like it?' Grisha again did not know what to say. He smiled in a lost way. Mitya was looking at him attentively, Glances of strangers always embarrassed Grisha. It was as though he feared that they might find something absurd in his appearance. Mitya was silent for a while, as he thought of something else that he might ask. "'What do you collect?' he asked. "'You've got a collection of something, haven't you? We all collect. I, stamps, ketchup, acrivalova, shells, leisha, butterflies. What do you collect?' "'Nothing.' said Grisha, flushing. "'Well, well,' said Mitya, with artless astonishment. "'So you collect nothing? That's very curious.' Grisha felt ashamed that he was not collecting anything, and that he had disclosed the fact. "'I, too, must collect something,' he thought to himself. But he could not decide to say this aloud. Mitya sat a little longer, then left him. Grisha felt a relief, but a new ordeal was in store for him. The nurse, engaged by the Samibi Aronovs for their youngest son, was strolling along the garden paths with a one-year-old child in her arms. She wished to rest, and chose the same bench upon which Grisha was sitting. He again felt uneasy. He looked straight before him, and could not even decide to move away from the nurse to the other end of the bench. The infant's attention soon became drawn to Grisha's protruding ears, and he leant forward towards one of them. The nurse, a robust, red-cheeked woman, concluded that Grisha would not mind. She brought her charge nearer to Grisha, and the pink infant caught Grisha's ear with his fat little hand. Grisha was paralyzed with confusion, but could not decide to protest. The child, laughing loudly and merrily, now let go of Grisha's ear, now caught hold of it again. The red-cheeked nurse, who enjoyed the game not less than the infant, kept on repeating, "'Let's go for him!' Let's give it to him. One of the boys saw the scene, and told the other boys that little Georgic was obstreperous with the quiet boy who was sitting so long on the bench. The children gathered round Georgic and Grisha, and laughed noisily. Grisha tried to show that he didn't mind, that he felt no pain, and that he also enjoyed the fun. But it grew harder and harder for him to smile, and he had a very strong desire to cry. He knew that he ought not to cry, that it was a disgrace, and he restrained himself with an effort. Happily, he was soon delivered. The blue-eyed Ledochka, upon hearing the children's boisterous laughter, went to see what had happened. She reproached the nurse. "'Aren't you ashamed to go on like this?' She herself had difficulty to keep from laughing at Grisha's pitiful, confused face, but she restrained herself and upheld her dignity as a grown young woman before the nurse and the children. The nurse rose and said, laughing, "'Georginka did it quite gently. The boy himself didn't say that it hurt him.' "'You mustn't do such things,' said Ledochka sternly. Georgic, unhappy because they had taken him away from Grisha, raised a cry. Ledochka took him in her arms and carried him away to quiet him. The nurse followed her 
but the boys and the girls remained. They thronged round Grisha and eyed him unceremoniously. Perhaps he's got stuck on ears, suggested one of the boys. That's why he doesn't feel any pain. I rather think you like to be held by your ears, said another. Tell us, said the little girl with the large blue eyes, which ear does your mother catch hold of most? His ears have been stretched out to order in a workshop, cried a merry youngster, and laughed loudly at his own joke. No, another corrected him. He was born like that. When he was very small, he was led not by his hand, but by his ear. Grisha looked at his tormentors like a small beast at bay, with a fixed smile on his face, when, suddenly, wholly unexpectedly to the cheerful company, he burst into tears. Many small drops fell on his jacket. The children grew quiet at once. They became uneasy. They exchanged embarrassed glances, and looked silently at Grisha, as he wiped the tears from his face with his thin hands. He appeared to be ashamed of his tears. "'Why should he be offended?' said the beautiful flaxen-haired catcher angrily. "'Who's done him any harm, the ugly duckling?' "'He's not an ugly duckling. You're an ugly duckling yourself,' intervened Mitya. "'I can't stand rude people,' said Catcher, growing red with vexation. A little brown-faced girl in a red dress looked long at Grisha, and knitted her brows as in reflection. Then she scanned the other children with her perplexed eyes, and asked quietly, why then did he smile? 2. It was not often that Grisha's wardrobe received important additions. His mother could not afford it. Hence every item gave Grisha great joy. The autumn cold came, and Grisha's mother bought an overcoat, a hat, and mittens. The mittens pleased Grisha more than anything else. On the holiday, after Mass, he put on his new things and went out to play. He loved to walk about in the streets, and he used to go out alone. His mother had no time to go out with him. She looked proudly out of the window as Grisha walked gravely by. She recalled at that moment her well-to-do relatives who had promised her so much and had done so little, and she thought, Well, I've managed it without them, thank God. It was a cold, clear day. The sun did not shine with its full brightness. The waters of the canals in the city were covered with their first thin ice. Grisha walked the streets, rejoicing in this brisk cold, in his new clothes, and with his naive fancies. He always loved to dream when he was alone, and he dreamt always of great deeds, of fame, of a bright, happy life in a rich house, indeed of everything that was unlike the sad reality. As Grisha stood on the bank of the canal, and looked through the iron railings at the thin ice that floated on the surface, he was approached by a street urchin in threadbare attire, and with hands red from the cold. He entered into conversation with Grisha. Grisha was not afraid of him, and even pitied him because of his benumbed hands. His new acquaintance informed him that he was called Mishka, but that his family name was Babushkin because he and his mother lived with his babushka. "'But then what is your mother's family name?' "'My mother's name?' repeated Mishka, smiling. "'She's called Matushkin, because my babushka is no babushka to her, but is her Matushka.' "'That's strange,' said Grisha with astonishment. "'My mother and I have one family name. We are called the Agumnovs.' "'That's because,' explained Mishka with animation, "'your grandfather was an Agumen. No, said Grisha, my grandfather was a colonel. All the same, it's likely that his father or someone else was an Agumen, and so you have all become the Agumnovs. Grisha did not know who his great grandfather was, so he said nothing. Mishka kept on eyeing his mittens. You have handsome mittens, he said. New ones, Grisha explained, with a joyous smile. It's the first time I've put them on. Do you see? Here is a little string drawn through. Well, you're a lucky one. And are they quite warm? Rather. I have also mittens at home. But I haven't put them on, because I don't like them. They are yellow, and I don't like yellow ones. Let me put yours on, and I'll run along and show them to my babushka, and ask her to get me a pair like them. 
Mishka looked at Grisha pleadingly, and his eyes sparkled enviously. "'You won't keep me waiting long?' asked Grisha. "'No, I live quite near here, just round the corner. Don't be afraid. Upon my word, in a minute.' Grisha trustfully took off his mittens and gave them to Mishka. "'I'll be back in a minute. Wait here. Don't go away,' exclaimed Mishka, as he ran off with Grisha's mittens. He disappeared round the corner, and Grisha was left waiting. He did not imagine that Mishka would fool him. He thought that he would simply run home, show his mittens, and return with them. He stood there long and waited, and Mishka did not even dream of returning. The short autumn day was already darkening. Grisha's mother, restless because of her boy's long absence, went out to look for him. Grisha at last understood that Mishka would not return. The poor boy turned sadly toward home, and he met his mother. "'Grisha, what have you done with yourself?' she asked, angry and glad at finding her son. Grisha did not reply. He seemed embarrassed as he rubbed his hands, red with cold. His mother then noticed that he did not wear his mittens. "'Where are your mittens?' she asked angrily, as she searched his overcoat pockets. Grisha smiled and said, "'I lent them to a boy for a short time, and he didn't bring them back.' 3. Years passed after years. The bold and pushing children, who once had gathered on Lisha Samibi Aronov's birthday, became bold and pushing men and women, and the urchin who had fooled Grisha, it goes without saying, found his way in life, while Grisha, of course, became a failure. As in his childhood, he went on dreaming, and in his dreams he conquered his kingdom, but in real life he could not protect himself from any enterprising person who pushed him unceremoniously out of his way. His relations with women were equally unsuccessful, and his faint-hearted attentions were not once rewarded by a responsive feeling. He had no friends. His mother alone loved him. Igumnov rejoiced when he found a position at a small salary, because his mother could live calmly now without worrying about a crust of bread but his happiness was of short duration. Soon his mother died. Grisha fell into depression, lost his spirits. Life seemed to him to be aimless. Apathy took hold of him. He had no interest in his work. He lost his place, and was soon in great need. Igumnov finally pawned his last possession, his mother's ring. As he walked out of the place, he smiled and his smile kept him from bursting into tears of self-pity. He had to see various people, and to ask them for work. But Igumnov was not good at this. He was backward and quiet, and he experienced a helpless confusion that prevented him from persisting in his dealings with men. While yet on the stairway of a man's house a fear would seize him, his heart would beat painfully, his legs would grow heavy, and his hand would stretch toward the bell irresolutely. During one of his most depressing and hungry days, Igumnov sat in the sumptuous private office of Alexei Stepanovich Samibiaranov, the father of the same Lisha whose birthday party remained memorable to him. Igumnov had already sent a letter to Alexei Stepanovich. After all, it was much easier to ask on paper than by word of mouth, and now he came for his answer. From the restless, solicitous manner of Samibi Aronov, a small, dry, old man with closely cut, silver-grey hair, he guessed that he would have a refusal. This made him feel wretched, but he could not help smiling an artless, pleasant smile, as though he wished to show that it did not matter in the least, that he really did not count on anything. The smile evidently irritated Samibi Aronov. "'I've got your letter, my dear fellow,' said he at last, in his dry, deliberate voice. "'But there's nothing that I can see just now.' "'Nothing?' mumbled Igumnov, growing red. "'Absolutely nothing, my dear fellow. Every place is taken, and I don't see anything in prospect for the near future. Perhaps something might be done for you at New Year.' 
I'll be glad of a chance even then, said Agumnov, smiling in such a way as to suggest that a mere eight months was of no account to him. Yes, I'll be very glad to do something then. If it depended upon me, you'd get your place to-day. I'd like very much to be of use to you, my good man. Thank you, said Agumnov. But tell me, asked Samibi Aronov sympathetically, why did you leave your old place? They found no use for me, answered Agumnov, confused. No use for you? Well, I hope we'll find some use for you. Let me have your address, my good fellow. Samibi Aronov began to rummage on his table for a piece of paper. Igumnov just then caught sight of his own letter under a marble paperweight. "'My address is in the letter,' he said. "'So it is,' said his host briskly. "'I'll make a note of it.' "'I have the habit,' observed Igumnov, rising from his place, "'always to write my address at the beginning of a letter.' "'A European habit,' commended his host. Igumnov took his leave and went out smiling, proud of his European habits, which, however, did not prevent him from feeling hungry. He was almost glad that the unpleasant conversation was at an end. He recalled all the polite words, and especially those that contained the promise. Foolish hopes awakened in him. But a few minutes later, as he was walking in the street, he realized that the promise would come to nothing. Besides, it was made for the future, and he had need of food now, and he must go to his lodgings with a heavy heart. What would his landlady say? What could he say to her? Igumnov began to walk more slowly. Then he turned in the opposite direction. Lost in gloom, he walked on, pale and hungry, through the noisy streets of the capital, past busy, satiated people. His smile vanished. The look of dark despair gave a certain significance to his usually little expressive features. He was now close to the Neva. The huge dome of the Isakievsky Cathedral glowed golden in the wide expanse of blue sky. The large open squares and streets were enveloped in the gentle, scarcely perceptible dust-like haze of the rays of the setting sun. The din of carriages was softened in these magnificent open spaces. Everything seemed strange and hostile to the hungry, helpless man. The beautiful, rich-coloured fruits behind the shop windows could not have been more inaccessible if they were under the watch of a strong guard. Children were playing merrily in the green square. Ugumnov looked at them and smiled. Unpleasant memories of his own childhood tormented him with an intense pity for himself. He reflected that it was only left to him to die. The thought frightened him, and again he reflected, Why shouldn't I die? Wasn't there a time when I did not exist? I shall have rest, eternal oblivion. Fragments of wise, strange thoughts came to him and soothed him. Agumnov was now on the embankment. He leant against the granite parapet and watch the restless waters of the river. A single move, he thought, and everything would be ended. But it was terrible to think of drowning, of struggling with one's mouth full of water, of being strangled by these heavy, cold sweeps of water, of battling helplessly, and of at last sinking from sheer exhaustion to the bottom, there to be carried by the undercurrents, and at last to be cast out, a shapeless corpse, upon some coast of the sea. Igumnov shivered and moved away from the river. He suddenly espied, not far away, his former colleague, Kirchhoff. Smartly dressed, cheerful, and self-satisfied, Kirchhoff was walking slowly and swinging a thin cane with a fancy handle. "'Ah, Grigory Petrovitch!' he exclaimed, as though he were glad of the meeting. "'Are you strolling, or are you on business?' "'Yes, I'm strolling. That is, on business,' said Igumnov. "'I think we're going the same way.' They walked on together. Kirchhoff's cheerful chatter only intensified Igumnov's mood. Moving his shoulders nervously, he addressed Kirchhoff with sudden resolution. "'Nikolai Sergeyevich, do you happen to have a rouble on you?' "'A rouble?' said Kirchhoff in astonishment. "'Why do you want it?' Igumnov flushed and began to explain in stammers. 
You see, I... Just one ruble is lacking. I have to get something. Something, you see. He breathed heavily in his agitation. He grew silent and smiled a pitiful, fixed smile. That means I shan't get it back, thought Kirchhoff. And now he spoke no longer in the same careless tone as before. I'd like to, but I haven't any spare cash, not a kopeck. I had to borrow some yesterday myself. Well, if you haven't it, you can't help it, mumbled Igumnov, and continued to smile. I'll simply have to get along without it. His smile irritated Kirchhoff, perhaps because it was such a pitiful, helpless affair. Why does he smile? thought Kirchhoff in vexation. Doesn't he believe me? Well, I don't care if he doesn't. I don't own the government exchequer. Why don't you come in sometimes and see us? he asked Agumnov in a careless, dry manner, as he looked elsewhere. I am always meaning to. Of course I'll come in, answered Agumnov in a trembling voice. What about today? There rose before him a picture of the cosy dining-room of the Kirchhoffs, the hospitable hostess, the samovar on the table, and the various tasty titbits. Today, asked Kirchhoff in the same careless, dry voice, no, we shan't be home today, but do step in some day before long. Well, I must turn up this lane. Goodbye. And he made haste to cross the wooden walk of the embankment. Nagumnov looked after him and smiled. Slow, incoherent thoughts crept through his brain. As Kirchhoff disappeared up the lane, Agumnov again approached the granite parapet, and trembling in cold terror, began slowly and awkwardly to climb over it. There was no one near. The Hoop by Fyodor Sologub A woman was taking her morning stroll in a lonely suburban street. A boy of four was with her. She was young and smart, and she was smiling brightly. She was casting affectionate glances at her son, whose red cheeks beamed with happiness. The boy was bowling a hoop, a large, new, bright yellow hoop. He ran after his hoop awkwardly, laughed uproariously with joy, thrust forward his plump little legs, bare at the knee, and flourished his stick. He needn't have raised his stick so high above his head, but what of that? What happiness! He had never had a hoop before. How briskly it made him run! And nothing of this had existed for him before. Everything was new to him. The streets in early morning, the merry sun, and the distant din of the city. Everything was new to the boy, and joyous and pure. A shabbily dressed old man, with coarse hands, stood at the street crossing. He pressed close to the wall, to let the woman and the boy pass. The old man looked at the boy with dull eyes and smiled stupidly. Confused, sluggish thoughts struggled within his almost bald head. A little gentleman, said he to himself, quite a small fellow, and simply bursting with joy. Just look at him cutting his paces. He could not quite understand it. Somehow it seemed strange to him. Here was a child, a thing to be pulled about by the hair. Play is mischief. Children, as everyone knows, are mischief-makers. And there was the mother. She uttered no reproach. She made no fuss. She did not scold. She was smart and bright. It was quite easy to see that they were used to warmth and comfort. On the other hand, when he, the old man, was a boy, he lived a dog's life. There was nothing particularly rosy in his life even now, though, to be sure, he was no longer thrashed, and he had plenty to eat. He recalled his younger days, their hunger, their cold, their drubbings. He had never had fun with a hoop or other playthings of well-to-do folks. Thus passed all his life, in poverty, in care, in misery. And he could recall nothing, not a single joy. He smiled with his toothless mouth at the boy, and he envied him. He reflected, what a silly sport! But envy tormented him. He went to work, to the factory where he had worked from childhood, where he had grown old, and all day he thought of the boy. It was a fixed, 
deep-rooted thought. He simply could not get the boy out of his mind. He saw him running, laughing, stamping his feet, bowling the hoop. What plump little legs he had, bared at the knee! All day long, amid the din of the factory wheels, the boy with the hoop appeared to him, and at night he saw the boy in a dream. Next morning, his reveries again pursued the old man. The machines were clattering, the labour was monotonous, automatic, the hands were busy at their accustomed tasks, the toothless mouth was smiling at a diverting fancy. The air was thick with dust, and under the high ceiling strap after strap, with hissing sound, glided quickly from wheel to wheel, endless in number. The far corners were invisible, for the dense escaping vapours. Men emerged here and there like phantoms, and the human voice was not heard for the incessant din of the machines. The old man's fancy was at work. He had become a little boy for the moment, his mother was a gentlewoman, and he had his hoop and his little stick. He was playing, driving the hoop with the little stick. He wore a white costume, his little legs were plump, bare at the knee. The days passed, the work went on, the fancy persisted. The old man was returning from work one evening, when he saw the hoop of an old barrel lying in the street. It was a rough, dirty object. The old man trembled with happiness, and tears appeared in his dull eyes. A sudden, almost irresistible desire took possession of him. He glanced cautiously around him, then he bent down, picked up the hoop with trembling hands, and smiling shamefacedly, carried it home with him. No one noticed him. No one questioned him. Whose concern was it? A ragged old man was carrying an old, battered, useless hoop. Who cared? He carried it stealthily, afraid of ridicule. Why he picked it up, and why he carried it, he himself could not tell. Still, it was like the boy's hoop, and this was enough. There was no harm in it lying about. He could look at it, he could touch it. It would stimulate his reveries. The whistle and turmoil of the factory would grow fainter, the escaping vapours less dense. For several days the hoop lay under the bed in the old man's poor, cramped quarters. Sometimes he would take it from its place and look at it. The dirty grey hoop soothed the old man, and the sight of it quickened his persistent thoughts about the happy little boy. It was a clear, warm morning, and the birds were chirping away in the consumptive urban trees somewhat more cheerfully than usual. The old man rose early, took his hoop, and walked a little distance out of town. He coughed as he made his way among the old trees and the thorny bushes in the woods. The trees, covered with their dry, blackish, bursting bark, seemed to him incomprehensibly and sternly silent. The odours were strange, the insects astonishing, the ferns of gigantic growth. There was neither dust nor din here, and the gentle, exquisite morning mist lay behind the trees. The old feet glided over the dry leaves, and stumbled across the old, gnarled roots. The old man broke off a dry limb, and hung his hoop upon it. He came upon an opening, full of daylight and of calm. The dewdrops, countless and opalescent, gleamed upon the green blades of newly mown grass. Suddenly, the old man let the hoop slide off the stick. He struck with the stick, and sent the hoop rolling across the green lawn. The old man laughed, brightened at once, and pursued the hoop like that little boy. He kicked up his feet and drove the hoop with his stick, which he flourished high over his head, just as that little boy did. It seemed to him that he was small, beloved, and happy. It seemed to him that he was being looked after by his mother, who was following close behind and smiling. Like a child on his first outing, he felt refreshed on the bright grass and on the still mosses. His goat-like, dust-grey beard, that harmonised with his sallow face, trembled, while his cough mingled with his laughter, and raucous sounds came from his toothless mouth. And the old man grew to love his morning hour in the woods with the hoop. He sometimes thought he might be discovered and ridiculed, 
and this aroused him to a keen sense of shame. This shame resembled fear. He would grow numb, and his knees would give way under him. He would look round him with fright and timidity. But no, there was no one to be seen, or to be heard. And having diverted himself to his heart's content, he would return to the city, smiling gently and joyously. No one had ever found him out, and nothing unusual ever happened. The old man played peacefully for several days, and one very dewy morning he caught cold. He went to bed, and soon died, dying in the factory hospital, among strangers, indifferent people. He smiled serenely. His memory soothed him. He too had been a child. He too had laughed and scampered across the green grass among the dark trees. His beloved mother had followed him with her eyes. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.